so with that, we are going to go ahead and um, introduce our first panel uh, of the day. Um, and that is being run by Supervisor Cindy Chavez. Uh, and for those of you who don't know Supervisor Chavez, um, she wears so many hats in the transportation realm that it would be impossible for me to um, describe them all, but I'll just say that Cindy is one of the best local elected officials that we have. Um, she's smart, strategic, compassionate, empathetic. She's everything that we need in a leader, um, and in particular in the transportation space. So I'm going to go ahead and just hand it over to uh, Cindy. Thank you, Shiloh. I'm so excited to be here. And um, I cannot believe how much amazing work you and your team are doing, really, in getting people excited about bicycles, even me, although not so not so good at it as Shiloh. Um, so I was really honored to be asked to, um, to join you today. And we have this amazing group of women on this panel. Like I am really excited. So let me just get right into it, introduce them, because you all gave me 4,000 questions to make sure we get through. No, no pressure, I know. So Davina, let me, is, let me just make sure we can wave to Davina. Where's Miss Davina? Is an, um, an e-bike owner, a councilwoman. I also know she is the past mayor of Belmont. She was appointed to the California Air Resources Board in 2020, which is where I serve with her. She's an amazing woman. Um, today, she is the San Mateo County City's representative to the Bay Area Air Quality Management District Board, where she serves as the Peninsula Traffic Congestion Relief Alliance and Community Equity and Health and Justice Committee. Jiminy Christmas, I didn't we need to think about that name again. And as a councilwoman, past mayor, attorney, past planning commissioner, environmentalist, and parent, she's working to improve the quality of life for the community she represents. Let's give her a big round of applause. Yay, 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 yay. All right. In 2020, Jen Woolison, Jen, did I do that right? Oh, excellent. Was elected to the Menlo Park City Council. Before her city council run, Jen was the founder and chair of Parents for Safe Routes, an advocacy group committed to getting kids to school safely. Parents for Safe Routes was named 2018 Program of the Year by SBBC, and Jen has served on a variety of committees and task forces for the city of Menlo Park, San Mateo County, local school districts, and advocacy coalitions. Jen has also been involved in issues relating to housing, sustainability, equity, and civic engagement. Yay, Jen, round of applause, woo. All right, Lisa Gauthier is the Vice President of, of Par Partner Success for Silicon Valley Leadership Group. And in this role, she manages the relationships between member companies and the SBLG. She was elected to the East Palo Alto City Council in 2012 has served as mayor and vice mayor and is currently serving as a council member. She was selected by the Silicon Valley Business Journal as one of the Silicon Valley's 100 Women of Influence for 2020. Let's give her a big, big round of applause. I'm so excited to see her. Um, and Margaret Abe Koga is in her fourth term on the Mountain View City Council, uh, and it seems like just yesterday. She was the first Asian American female on the City Council, and she served as mayor of Mountain View in 2009 and in 2020. Margaret serves on a number of regional bodies, including the MTC Metropolitan Transportation Commission, the Valley Transportation Authority Board of Directors, and the Air Quality Management District. And she is the Silicon Valley Clean Energy Board and has lived in Mountain View since 1998. Wow. Okay, so let's welcome all these underachievers. Woo, we're so excited to be with all of you today. So we're gonna begin with a question for everyone. And um, I'm gonna randomly pick you. Um, so. I'm gonna start with Lisa, I'm just gonna give you a heads up. So, um, so we are gonna begin with a question. What should cities be doing to preserve benefits like less traffic, more people walking and biking, slower streets that the COVID world has brought to us? What should we be doing? I think as cities, we need to encourage ourselves and businesses work, work from home. What has work from home done? It's reduced traffic on the street. It's, it's provided us clear air. And so we're in a much better place. When you think about people who are trying to ride bikes, if there's not traffic on the street, it's a much safer place. So in our city, we are encouraging, and I, I appreciate my commute to work when I get to work from home is much shorter. So I would say let's encourage people and businesses to continue to work from home as much as possible. 
Great, thank you, Lisa. And Lisa, we, we're work, we're having a little difficult time hearing you, so I want to just give you that heads up. Margaret, why don't you uh, respond to that same question? Thank you, Cindy, and thank you, everyone, for having me here. Um, I agree with Lisa, and I just wanted to highlight um, Cindy's leadership um, last year. As um, she, as mentioned, she wears many hats, and um, I think I, I'd say through through BACMED and VTA, um, Cindy led a, a regional effort to. Um, we started with calling it cut the commute, but I think we ended up saying carbon free commutes and the idea as Lisa was uh, mentioning was to encourage um, folks to work from home agencies to um, to encourage 25% work from home. Um, you know, we've definitely seen the benefits of that, especially in terms of clean air. And so I wanna thank Cindy for her um, leadership on that. Um, I would say uh, specifically in tort with uh, bikes, um, creating more low stress bikeways. And I know we'll talk a little bit about this more later, probably in terms of the Slow Streets initiative or in Mountain View, we really focused on our downtown Castro Street and closing that to auto traffic to allow for more pedestrians and, and bicyclists and um, having uh, more of those and having um, protected bikeways um, are, I think, would be very helpful. Excellent. Thank you so much. Jen? Good morning, Cindy, and good morning, everyone. I'm just thrilled to be here. Um, I think that one of the benefits of COVID was just more people walking. Um, I think uh, one of the first weeks of COVID, I posted something on Twitter, and I said, the new rush hour, and it was families walking down um, the street near my house. And I think that was one of the most um, beneficial things where people actually kind of came out and enjoyed their communities on a much more personal um, community-based level. And so I would really look at land use and um, placemaking and how we can develop kind of this 15-minute city concept that uh, I think was discussed yesterday of really putting services, jobs, um, schools, parks near closer to where people live so that uh, the, the fantasy of going out with your family, being able to grab an ice cream, hang to the park, bumping into your neighbors, is realized and we don't always have to get in our car to go everywhere. Excellent, all right, Davina. All right, what can I say that no one else has said, huh? Um, <laughs> I'm happy to be here with all, with all the folks. Um, so, you know, what we saw that I thought was really interesting is how quickly local action can change our streets and our sidewalks. Almost overnight, um, we started to create these slow uh, street programs and creating more human civic spaces. And I think to preserve those benefits, we just need to shine light on additional policy and infrastructure needs to support these modes. And that means um, cities focusing on well-connected paths and protected off-street paths. It means secure bike parking at transit um, and throughout your city. Lighting and other safety measures are so important. Signage alerting folks to um, multi-modes of, of travel. And um, I can't um, help but speak about housing. And I know in Belmont, you know, our approach is like a smart transit oriented housing. And so if we wanna preserve the benefits we've seen, uh, create housing that's within the Caltrain and high frequency traffic uh, corridors and uh, local jurisdictions play a critical role for that planning and promoting. And so I guess at the end of the day to just really preserve benefits, we need to invest, coordinate, and collaborate together amongst the many cities. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious about this, and the, the staff gave us this question, which is, what are some of the challenges that we saw during COVID, and how has that affected city priorities? And I, and I just want to expand on that just slightly to say, you know, what, from your perspective, based on the, the real vision around the, the Silicon Valley uh, Bike Coalition, how do you see these challenges and, and what does it mean in terms of emerging city priorities? Like as you all think about what you're going to try to do with art money or, you know, any, any other resource, where does, um, you know, where does the, the safe passages and really the protection of the environment come into play? 
and I, and because I changed the question a little bit, I don't want to, I don't want to, so I'm just curious if, if anybody wants to jump in there, feel free, jump in. Okay, no jumping, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, certainly our, you know, our um, priority had been, has been, um, in Mountain View, um, you know, trying to get relief and assistance out to folks in need um, as quickly as possible. So really, we really did focus our efforts on, um, frankly, just financial assistance. So um, we had a rent relief program. Um, we gave, provided over five, about $5 million. Um, we have a small business grant program. Um, so that was our, you know, real focus last year. But I, I'm proud of our um, staff because despite um, that added layer of COVID you know, relief and COVID efforts, um, we actually made quite a bit of progress in um, terms of uh, bike projects. So we have um, more um, bike lane projects that are moved through. And then um, you know, uh, one in particular that I'm excited about um, that's moving forward is um, El Camino. We will be having bike lanes on El Camino as we as redevelopment occurs. And um, this is a 10 year project, frankly, and it was actually SVBC who brought it forward about 10 years ago. And back then, you know, I think I might have been the only one or maybe there were two of us on council that were excited about it. Lots of skepticism and it took a while, but um, we're at a point where because Caltrans will be repaving um, El Camino in the next year or two, um, we'll be able to implement bike lanes. And so, um, yes, you know, we definitely um, had to focus on COVID. That was an added layer. We also lo lost staff last year. I think, you know, it was a, a, I think we saw it everywhere. And right now, as we come back, um, the job market is rather tight. So I'd say staffing is one of the biggest challenges we have right now. Um, and so it's like, how do we ramp a staff up? Because what I also see on the positive is funding availability. So, you know, whether it's VTA Measure B funds, um, MTC has some funds that um, they've distributed recently. So we've actually been able to obtain about $30 million in grant funding during this time. Um, so the money's there. We just now have to get the staff there um, to move projects forward. And, and that's something I would ask of everyone is for their patience, because it does take time to um, hire, you know, recruit and hire staff and get them up to speed. And, and I know during COVID folks had a lot of time on, you know, <laughs> the public had time. So they were very anxious for us to get things done. But um, you know, just ask that folks be mindful that all of this, whether it was just even closing Castro Street, took a lot of effort. It was like multi departments working on one project. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to weigh in on this this question? And really, we're interested. We're all yours. Yeah, I, I think I can chime in if I if I can um, on this question and the work that East Palo Alto has done. What COVID has done to it for us is just brought to mind just some of the areas where we were lacking, and it it, it brought to our attention. We were able to close some sidewalks that weren't um, um, closed off, especially around schools and safe route to, to schools. And when I think about one of the recipients of it of the award was Mid Pen and closing off that space on that route really took a lot of the bikes off of university, which is very, very dangerous. So having that that's protected and having people, having not only bicyclists, but pedestrians who can walk um, on a path that is closed off has been very, very helpful for us. You know, the other thing it's, it's brought to mind, I, I like to walk my grandson and it brought danger. It brought some areas where we weren't even thinking about to mind. So there are a lot of places that we need to fix so that our, our streets and our community is, is mobile and walkable in a safe way. So those are some of the things for me as well too. Thank you, Smart. I think we all have kind of similar priorities, just making sure um, that we don't return to that traffic congestion and to focus on change of behavior. And that's something we all have to do together, but the cities can promote that change of thought 
And so um, for Belmont, um, we are a small uh, staffed uh, city of 134 folks. So we're pretty lean and mighty, but um, we, we had some budgetary issues that we had to deal with. And so our priorities changed slightly, but a great project that came out of, uh, of COVID was um, the ability to receive $800,000 grant that the bike coalition supported us with um, to close uh, class two bike lane gaps and rebuild the sidewalks as uh, uh, the council member just said. And so um, we are continuing to prioritize streets, but I will, th I will honestly say that biking um, is maybe on a lower level because there's, there's um, sidewalks and there's road pathways, but they're all together and we're thinking about them. We just wanna be honest that there's so many levels um, of important um, road work that needs to be done for safety, bike and walking and pavement management projects. Um, and, and we've also uh, been excited about the idea of partnering with organizations that have the bandwidth you know, what can we do? What are the little things we can do to support that? And I'm thinking of uh, Dr. Tim Busiak's project where he's trying to get e-bikes for high school students um, to use um, and, and, and working with them. Like how can we get people out of their cars and onto bikes? And as everyone knows in Belmont, those hills can be pretty terrible. So um, <laughs> an e-bike goes a long way. I have uh, an e-bike myself. So um, it's a priority but it's, it's gonna be difficult. There are many priorities ahead of us. Um, I'm just gonna plus one the e-bikes. You all know I'm a big e-biker. Um, by big, I mean like I go a mile on my e-bike, but I do it a lot. <laughs> um, I think that the one thing about COVID and this last you know, 18 months, and I'll include in there you know, the national election that seems like it was, did that actually happen? and also the George Floyd murder and the, the racial awakening. Also the ability of more people to zoom in to community meetings and participate in city council meetings. There's just kind of, I felt almost like a shift in civic engagement, who is being engaged, what people were paying attention to, new conversations taking place that weren't happening a year and a half ago. Um, and it's a huge opportunity. And I think as we, um, you know, I still think sadly we're kind of in COVID, but as we emerge from COVID, we have to really reflect on where we were before and where we want to be after and in the future. And um, I don't know who said the quote of like, you never waste a, a good crisis or emergency or something. But I think on, on so many topics that are related to transportation and sustainable biking and all this around climate. You know, we've seen that, you know, science is, has exponential um, consequences if you don't address it early on uh, with COVID. And, uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions are mostly caused by transportation re um, related, you know, cars, um, by housing. Uh, we've seen a, a lot of new um, presentations in Menlo Park around the color of law and redlining, um, and I think a renewed interest in um, looking at our historical um, practices of segregation and how that relates to where we put things, which relates to transportation, and so really looking at a more equitable future. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, just just all these topics. We're in a moment right now where we need um, those of you who are involved in the bike and safety uh, movement to really stay involved. And it's gonna take persistence. It's gonna take, um, it's gonna be a long slog, but the, 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 the opening is there. And so um, I think we just need, just need to seize upon it. You know, just um, one of the questions in the chat um, has made me think a little bit about, again, you know, sort of the COVID opportunity. And I, Jen, I think that the point you're raising is really an important one. And, and here's the question. Tech workers and offices have had the advantage of high-speed internet. When we started working and schooling from home, it became obvious that there is a digital divide. How do we bring equal access to high-speed internet for everyone so they have the option of staying home and really reducing congestion? And um, yeah, and I, I, 
I would just, yeah, I'm really curious about all of your thinking. I will just highlight one thing um, it, before I turn it over to the panel, and that is that there's a tremendous amount of resource in, in the um, state's final budget for exactly this um, opportunity. And so what's gonna be important to understand is how will cities engage and use it? So ladies, I'll turn it back over to you. Anybody wanna dive into the digital divide? The abyss of the digital divide that we will fix in our lifetimes. Jen? I mean, I don't know if I can speak specifically to the digital divide, but I think that tolerating um, these inequities of access, not just to internet, but, but to everything are, is no longer acceptable. And um, it's gonna be about involving communities who have historically been underrepresented and making sure they're at the table. Um, and just really, it's, it's, it's on the community leaders and residents to really push for um, equity and parity in our communities. And so, um, so that, that's what I have to say about that. I would say if I could add, you know, it's also gonna be important that there's private and public partnerships and getting uh, the digital divide um, eliminated. Um, I, I, you know, our budgets are already under pressure. I don't see the cities really making it on their own. And so what can these huge companies uh, with billion dollar profits, what can they do to support the communities that they are in? And us really calling upon them um, to, to work together um, to make changes. I, I think that's, that's where we can both uh, put our step forward uh, the best. And I know um, that there are a lot of cities um, that are trying to look for those monies that Cindy talked about. And in particular with e-bikes, there is a huge amount that's coming from CARB. Um, and it would be great um, if folks like on this call can look into the funding plan for uh, clean transportation incentives and support um, just trying to distribute um, those monies to, to um, get people um, uh, to different places. And, and the one, the other thing that I'll just quickly add that I think is really important is, you know, not everybody can work from home and we need to figure out how to uplift public transit and uh, make sure that we can get people out of um, single occupancy vehicles. Um, and we talk often about um, working from home and that's great. And I'm glad we have individuals that can do that. But what can we do to support those who can't, those uh, frontline workers? And it's bolstering public transit. Uh, Supervisor uh, Chavez knows all about that um, and, and, and supporting uh, and cities joining together to figure out how to support uh, mass mobility strategies. Council member, um, Hurt, I agree with you that those are some of the things that are so important. The whole single occupancy vehicle, how do we get people out of those vehicles? And for cities like East Palo Alto, we don't have a lot of public transportation coming in. So we have to have a more robust public transportation system that's gonna allow people to get to work in a timely manner. If that doesn't change people, we're, you're not gonna get people out of their vehicles. If it's gonna take them longer to ride public transportation to get to work than to get into their vehicles. So I know there are organizations in the Blue Ribbon um, Commission or study, we're looking at transportation and transit right now. That is gonna be very, very critical for that. Um, I saw in the chat, and I do agree, when we're talking about digital divide, it was, um, it was embarrassing to see the digital divide and what was happening with communities. It doesn't make sense to have companies like AT&T, Comcast, and some of these larger companies who can't figure out how we can get telephone co connections to everybody. Why can't we get um, the internet to those who need it? And our children are suffering and falling behind because we can't fix this. We can fix this and we have to. I just wanted to add um, my thanks to the school community because they really did take leadership in um, addressing the digital divide issue. I, I know there's like a county effort going on and um, what I uh, realized in conversations with our, our school district um, leaders is the need for our cities to, um, to partner with, with them. Um, there's a lot of um, work we could do together to be more efficient. 
Um, and it's funny, I, I, was, I just wanted to share a story that um, one of my former colleagues used to, every year we'd go to the, like the National League of Cities conference and he'd come back and say, we have to become a smart city. And, um, you know, we, uh, we didn't we didn't really take it seriously unfortunately um and then this with covid we you know see the the real challenges of of um not being that smart city and i think <laughs> we have taken that to heart more now um it's a you know it's a lot of uh groundwork that needs to be done um i, I know it's signed in the chat and i was reading the um federal infrastructure bill yesterday um i know there's funding in there um for for this issue so um i'm excited i hope that you know we can um, get some of the, that those resources um, into our, our communities here and, and work with, you're right, work with our companies and we have all these high tech companies. And I'll say, you know, not to be disparaging, but we actually did try to work with um, a, a certain company to put um, fiber down and we were on a track and um, and we actually lost several years because they ended up um, changing gears and not doing that um, project. And so um, that did set us back now um, a few years and, and we just need to, um, I guess, up our efforts and, and make it more of a priority. You know, one thing I would say on this topic is that I think that, um, that we have been meeting on this topic um, for 30 years. And the governor and the state legislature did something very bold on internet accessibility by creating um, funding for middle mile and really for collaborations with the pu public sector, because frankly, we were the public sector at, sitting at the table with the private sector, waiting for the private sector to support our visions and our dreams. And this creates a more balanced playing field. So one thing I would say to all of us is that this is an issue that I do not think you can decouple from economic development from climate change from from congestion and you know if you think about this if we're really thinking about equity in its most meaningful terms uh you know it's water garbage electricity and internet access so at, at the home so you can look for a job you don't you don't have to work from home to still need access um to be able to do medical appointments mental health appointments so I think this is time for the unusual suspects to get together and not cede any space so go forth and I'm, that's an area that I'm very excited about. So happy to talk to any of you about that. You know, there's a really interesting question in the, in the chat, and I, I'm just gonna read it to all of you and see who, again, who wants to jump in. Really interested in reactions to the federal infrastructure bill and how it will impact local cities. Anybody wanna dive in on that? Um, Jen? I saw you kind of lean in, so I didn't mean to pick on you. Did you were you no, going to scratch your? Um, so I, it? I'm very focused on local um, things. So to be honest, I haven't read thoroughly. I do pay a lot of attention. Um, Beth Osborne um, is with the it's like America Walks or or one of the uh, safety groups, and I know she has concerns about how much is in there for active transportation versus uh, transportation for America. Thank you, Emma. Um, uh, I know she has concerns about just the emphasis still on car culture. Um, I, you know, I will we'll take whatever we can get and I'm sure our staff is looking into that. I do want to um, say a quick shout out to uh, Congresswoman Anna Eshoo. Um, there were some congressional earmarks um, and she was able to get uh, six and a half million dollars for our bike and pedestrian uh, tunnel that uh, should go under the train tracks at Middle Avenue, um, which is gonna be a huge uh, game changer in transportation in Menlo Park. Um, it'll really connect one side of the city with the other, um, major school route, major major everything. So I'm really encouraged by that. So I'm, I'm very excited. Um, I know Pete Buttigieg, um, I see pictures of him biking all over DC. So I'm encouraged. I, I mean, I think the alternative would have been horrible so we'll take what we can get, um, but I think it's going to need pressure from all levels of government to really change the culture in our country um, towards this new vision that we're all working towards. Anybody else, anybody else want to weigh in on that? Um, I, I, I was, as 
looking at it and I didn't see um, much funding for active transportation. It's, um, you know, roads. And what I was really excited about is that um, dollars for transit. Um, I think we, you know, all can very much use that here in the Bay Area. Um, but in terms of like road repairs, I think as we, um, if with that funding, perhaps we just look at roads differently. Make, we, we've been focusing on complete roads and complete streets in Mountain View. Um, El Camino, I'll bring that up again as we, you know, repave, re, redevelop. Um, we can start adding the bike infrastructure. Um, so, even sidewalk improvements are, are, you know, are helpful for pedestrians. So I think that's how we can try to incorporate um, the, fund, the infrastructure bill funding into active transportation or alternative modes of transportation. So what about this, ladies? Um, you know, so there's the American Rescue Plan, there's infrastructure dollars that are coming from the infrastructure bill. So there, there are resources coming locally. And just to use Margaret's example, um, so I think the staff says here that as an example, Menlo Park will get $8 million of ARP money. I guess the question is, do you see opportunities for um, uh, opportunities for active transportation to be coupled with other resources? And how are you able to prioritize that in each of your cities? And if you've thought a little bit about it, and I think Margaret, you answered that question, but I'm just curious, are there other, other projects or programs that you're thinking about that um, that you might want to just lift up today for for our team, our crew here. I, I think it started there, and I know that we have our light tree program where we're rebuilding some affordable housing. It's coupled with transportation and Sam Trans having a bus route there, and right by where these apartments are, there's a bike. The bike lanes have been really um, uplifted, and new bike lanes have been put in. So having housing, affordable housing next to transit and ensuring that there's their bike lanes is really, really important. And we're, we'll, we will continue to do that. Also, we have received, and we received some money for university to make the university safer. And I know we're gonna be able to put some bike lanes in there and make sure that pedestrians can cross safely as well. So those, the funding that comes in continues to make, help us make a better and safer city. But again, if you're doing housing, let's couple housing, transportation, and bikes together. That's a great point, Lisa, thank you. Anybody else have any strategies they're gonna be employing? I, I know for us, um, we went back and looked at our transit-oriented development as well, and we adopted new BMT thresholds for CEQA. Uh, we put a new transportation demand management policy forward. Um, we also put a new transportation impact fee for new development. And so um, we're trying to think of all the different ways that we can um, try to improve uh, traveling. And, and a lot of it is, is staunched in, in policy um, and trying to ensure that there's biking and walking and transit and encouraging all of those. Um, to improve the system. And again, housing, uh, we're doing uh, Belmont Downtown Village housing um, and using monies and dollars to improve those public spaces that we all share together. Um, yeah, I would just add that um, whenever there's you know an influx of funding that comes into a city, it can kind of be like a grab. Um, for lots of different groups and lots of different interests. So um, I'm a big, you know, I, I'm, I like fairness and process and uh, making sure that we do things thoughtfully uh, with a vision in mind and of course with equity in mind. And with these COVID relief dollars, I think it's really important to, to think about who's been affected most by COVID. Um, you know, there's been a lot of rhetoric over the last year and a half about essential workers and how essential they are. And then, you know, how, how are we treating them with dignity in our communities and on the streets? So to me, I see a, a nexus or a tie-in between uh, using the funding on those most affected. And so um, I think Menlo Park is planning on having, you know, a large community conversation around how funding should be used. Um, I think transportation projects will definitely be on the table, but I think it'll be important to um, really consider the, the populations um, related to COVID and um, how that relates to that, that specific funding. 
If I can add, um, I wanted to piggyback on Davina's um, comments about policy efforts and um, a lot of uh, what Davina mentioned about TDMs and um, transportation impact fees are, are, um, are policies that uh, Mountain View has also implemented. And um, I, would, I wanted to point out um, our North Bay Shore area in particular, that's where our, our business, we used to call them business parks are, um, as most many of you probably have read, um, we are going to be allowing housing um, there. So the idea of housing near jobs um, is um, what we're trying to implement. But also um, something that we did implemented, um, this was again back almost 10 years ago, but um, you know, back then we already had a traffic problem, congestion problem, because that area, there's only three entrance ways. And so in a lot of people complain, especially in the morning, how hard it is to get into North Bay Shore or get through even 101 during that time because of the congestion. So we actually put in a, um, a, a SOV cap of 45% uh, or, or that was our goal. And um, every year, every twice a year, um, we do these traffic counts. And um, as we allow new redevelopment to happen, um, that we have a, a, a certain cap and that cap has to be met um, for two consecutive counts in order for new development to occur. And so um, it's, you know, it's been a work in progress. We actually quite, haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, we're trying to find other ways to, to get to that. Um, but I think that is, you know, very, it's really, it was important to just deal with the congestion we had already before we added to that by adding more um, redevelopment. And we're now actually starting to look at, um, um, congestion pricing too as a, a possibility for um, that area um, just to um, to um, discourage SOVs and encourage um, you know other modes the the kind of the alarming or, or the um, concerning thing I, I've seen is with these traffic counts we look at you know how many bicyclists how many pedestrians other modes and the bike count has actually dropped in the last three years. And um, I you haven't had a chance to, or we haven't really looked in, had a chance to look at why that is, but um, you know, the hope was with you know, higher congestion, folks would switch to bikes and that's not happening. Um, so we are in, in, um, increasing our efforts to improve our you know, bike ways towards there, um, um, towards North Bay Shore, we're building a new, um, bike bridge over 101. Um, we're working on a cycle track from the transit center to North Bay Shore. So again, going back to building more bike infrastructure and pedestrian infrastructure, I think is what we have to, um, to really work on. Can I add something too? I, th I think it's really important that we start to talk about this so that we can kind of get to what was just said about people not feeling spurred to get on a bicycle. The climate change, the health and the equity impacts uh, of, of getting on a bike and how important it is. And I remember reading not too long ago, um, some of our greatest burdens or health impacts in the state are from chronic diseases and, and they're related to a lack of physical activity. And so more walking and biking is essential for us to really promote and talk about all the time. And and continue as cities and as advocates to connect it to things like health, to things like climate change. It, it's more than just um, congestion management. And it's something, and I think you said it earlier, Supervisor Chavez, about it boosts our social and economic opportunities. You know, we'll have healthier cities, healthier residents, um, if people just changed um, some of their norms and, and help cities. Um, not fight cities, but really help cities um, to, to um, promote uh, biking and walking. And, and can I also add that one of the other things that is happening through Live in Peace, which is one of our nonprofits, they've worked with Facebook and their bikes and they have opened up a bike shop. And with that group, we get together. I During COVID, they started riding bike, bikes as a community. So they would invite you over on a Friday morning and you'd ride across Dumbarton Bridge if 
your lungs could take it and and ride back. And then on some weekends you would ride and go to go to lunch or in another city. So it really encouraged people to ride bikes. We're also trying to figure out like now how do we put lights on our bikes and music and make it a really fun project where we're all getting out and not driving our cars, but riding our bikes and enjoying our city and giving our exercise. You know, um, it's interesting. I, I just saw something in the chat where where someone commented on it, how they use this term, shoreline is scary, cars drift into bike lanes. And I, I just want to ask, um, this was a question that the staff really wanted to make sure that we talked about, and that is about speeding. And, you know, because we saw, I, I'm not kidding you, I, I know you all have experienced, it's terrifying how fast um, people are driving. And how how is, is traffic enforcement not funded really robustly? Or is it do we need more traffic enforcement? Is there money to do that, you know, to really slow the traffic down? Or is it another solution that we're looking for? And I'm curious because I, I, um, I really like to ride my bike, I, and, but there are places I do not like to ride my bike. And it, it kind of terrifies me truthfully, right? So um, what are your thoughts? Are your cities doing anything specific relative to traffic enforcement? Did you have to cut it during COVID? Or are you gonna add it back if you did? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with this one. Um, in our um, budget cuts last year before I was on council, they did cut the traffic division for Menlo Park. Um, and uh, in the discussions that we're starting to have about reimagining public safety and uh, police reform, the council did not authorize that to be reinstated because um, we're we want to first have these community conversations. And um, yesterday's uh, panel on uh, traffic and, and police enforcement was, was excellent and addressed a lot of the issues that we're grappling with here. That being said, um, our police chief has the ability to move um, people around in his own department, and he has moved some regular patrol into traffic. So I think there's some real institutional um, bias towards traditional traffic enforcement that needs to be addressed. Um, I totally agree with the panelists yesterday, for those of you who are on the, the traffic enforcement um, session, that the real root of the solution is designing, is road design and um, designing our streets for slower movement. Um, you know, speed limits are one thing and I completely uh, support the changing the 85th percentile rule with, uh, with the state legislation. Um, we're also doing everything we can in Menlo Park to lower speed limits. Um, actually on Tuesday night city council agenda, there's a consent calendar item to lower the speed limits within 500 feet of schools to 15 miles an hour and between 15, um, between 500 and 1,000 feet to I believe it's 25 miles an hour when kids are present. So there are some things we can do, but at the end of the day, we all know that it's not what's on the sign. It's what's what the road looks like and feels like for, for drivers. And that's just up to us as council people um, to make decisions um, to push our public works department. And we need supportive advocates um, like from SVBC to talk about, you know, how safety is more important than parking spots. Um, and uh, I think all of us here agree with that, but it, it's it's going to be a slug and and it's it's critical. We all know how dangerous uh, speed is, and it's not just speed. We all can see the size of vehicles are getting larger. I keep looking at these new pickup trucks, and they are frightening. Um, and I don't know why people need them. Uh, you know, I think everyone here would say get a cargo bike. I guess some tradespeople need big trucks, but you know others don't. And so um, I think it's really a cultural shift, and we need to lead and. Um, and figure out a, a different way forward. Great, thank you. Any other thoughts or comments on this? No, I, I, I agree, uh, Supervisor. I think, and when you think about the streets and making them safe, how do you have those traffic? We need more traffic calming measures. I was in Tennessee and there were a lot of roundabouts that really caused you to slow down and go around the roundabouts, maybe bulb outs on the curbs, but things that are gonna make people slow down. And East Palo Alto, when we have a, a street, it, sometimes it doesn't matter how many stop signs because people don't always pay attention to the stop signs. They go through those as well. But how can we put those traffic calming measures in place? And East Palo Alto doesn't have necessarily a dedicated uh, traffic enforcement um, division. And that's something that we continue to have a conversation about. Um, but I agree, uh, more traffic calming 
measures for and and protected bike lanes. There's a protected bike lane on Polgis that makes so much sense that if, if it's protected by barriers that bicyclists feel comfortable. Davina? Thanks, Lisa. Um, sure, I, I think it was all just said, but I'll add, you know, protected bike lanes um, in some jurisdictions are difficult. Um, so how do we um, try to share that space more and, and think about it for the future? Um, and I think it's really important that we also start communicating, slow down, you know, let's use, um, let's say that often. And I, I think of some places, um, I'm afraid to say the word next door, where uh, <laughs> people talk all the time about the need to slow down. And, and, but maybe there's a way we can do it that invites people into the conversation and doesn't push people away or make it an us versus them. Um, and, and so I think it's, it's gonna be, um, I know in Belmont, um, it, it's difficult for us to have protected lanes uh, for biking, but we're going to find a way to do that. Um, and, and for us, the speeding didn't really increase. It's been status quo, but the reduction and the volume was so noticeable. And I think it made a lot of people think, I don't wanna go back to the way it was before. What can we do? And, and we're seeing people walking to the store with bags and carts and, and, um, and, and, and those are all great things. It has nothing to do with the staff uh, or the city work, but communicating that that's what people are doing and doing it in a fun way, I think will be really important to continue into the future. You know, um, I, of course, followed almost none of the rules that the staff gave me, <laughs> so I apologize. I'm, but, so I'm just gonna do, I'm just gonna say this. I'm gonna do a quick time check. So we only have about four more minutes. And I um, obviously want to um, say that there's some great, great ideas in the chat about what we could be doing. And, um, and I see that, I'm going to just read this. SVLG had an awesome biking vision for the region. A renewed Stanford GUP offers a chance to expand the bike shed around the region. How can the Mountain View vision, the El Camino Grand Boulevard vision, be combined to move forward in this movement. And I think that kind of question actually is exactly where we should end. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, because I, I think this really is about what, you know, the, the um, why we're here today and why we're all here to support SBBC because we trust the organization. We know it's a great organization. Shiloh, you and your team are small and mighty and really working at changing cultural norms in our region. And so on that end, what I wanna just give everybody like a quick 30 seconds. This is the magic wand question. It's actually one of my favorite questions. And so I, I want to just um, ask it is if you had a magic wand, which I think we should all get um, when we get elected, I think people think we get one, but we don't. Um, let me just make sure I get that. If you had a magic wand, what would you, what's the one thing you would do today to improve your city? 30 seconds, round robin, no pressure. Davina. Okay, I'll kick it off. Uh, it would be streets with protected bike lanes uh, through our main thoroughfares, designated safe bike trails throughout the city that would be connected to a super bike highway along El Camino Real that seamlessly, without any cars impeding the way, go to San Francisco or San Jose, straight shot over to Pacifica or to the East Bay. Um, I'll have my fingers crossed on that. All right, Lisa. I, you know, more protected um, bike lanes for sure throughout and encouraging and, and, and educating the community that we do have bike lanes that will take us around uh, the, the, the Bay Area, the peninsula and having them to utilize those um, and getting some of these cars off the street. There are too many cars that are parked um, and it makes mobility just impossible. So I would remove most, a lot of the cars. Excellent, all right, Margaret. Um, I think it's already been said, the protected bike lanes. Um, and I get, I would add to that um, a regional bike route. Um, and uh, I know that there has been an effort. Um, we, we are part of it, Mountain View, um, to create one to Redwood City. Um, we're also working with Sunnyville on an undercrossing of the uh, train tracks at Bernardo. But I think we do need to work together amongst our, um, our various cities to build the, I think it was mentioned, the super bike highway, but something like that would be ideal. Um, I'm gonna go back to my 15 minute city idea. 
um, really locate our services and everything we need very close by so that you know, biking and pedestrian access is really good. And then also I think bikes are great, um, but we also need to um, have it work with transit and get our transit system up and running. And I see pictures, is it Uderich? I never know how to pronounce it in the Netherlands. There's like this town where they have these like bike parking garages near transit that are like insane, that look like they're amazing. And like, that would be the fantasy. So we can bike locally. Those who want to go the long distance, go for it. Um, but those of us who after a mile or two on their e-bike is ready to sit down, <laughs> then get on hop on transit too. So just totally integrated. So um, all of you, you're amazing leaders. I'm so excited that you are here today. The enthusiasm, the foresight, I'm looking forward to continuing to work with all of you. And Shiloh, thank you so much for letting me join you today. And, and just to say this, you know, um, I know these are challenging times. It's going to stay tough. But here's the thing. When, when there's a lot happening in the world and change is afoot, it's when we get a chance to get through that window of change and shove as much stuff through it as we can. So everybody get through that window, take as many people, many good ideas as you can, and let's keep changing the world. So thank you all very much. Thanks for letting us join you. Be well. Thank you. Thank you to uh, you guys. Obviously, there's not much more I can say. Um, Cindy, just Supervisor Chavez just summed it up so beautifully. And I think you all saw exactly why we put this panel together and exactly why we asked Supervisor Chavez to lead it. Um, these are some amazing folks that we are so fortunate to have making policy decisions on these issues. So thank you so much. Um, Jen, it's, it's Utrecht is, is the city you're talking about. And um, I, I just also wanted to say, just echo what both Jen and uh, Councilmember Gauthier said about planning for 15 minute cities and planning through the lens of being able to feel wonderful walking your grandson down the sidewalk. I mean, that is absolutely the lens that we need to be uh, looking at this stuff through. So thank you for saying it. I thought that was a great way of framing things. Um, I also, before we go on, wanna just, um, uh, uh, correct something that um, was put in the chat um, uh, about the SVLG study. It was actually a joint venture and Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition study that was put out there. I know sometimes we can conflate uh, SVLG and joint venture. It's easy to do, um, but I used to work for SVLG for 14 years, um, and I know that that study, after I came over to SVBC, we did that in partnership with, with joint venture, and I'm hoping that uh, Emma might be able to drop the link in the chat because it was a wonderful vision that has um, been followed up in uh, Joint Ventures Index to incorporate some of those indicators in their annual report. 